Good morning, members of the family of God, and welcome to our service today. A service in which we can come to sing God's praises, a service where we can come to worship Him, a service where we can come and sit at the communion table. Welcome. May each one of you experience God's closeness today. So hear the traditional greeting of the believers. Ndia, Nibulisa, Nonke ge gama, Lenkosi yetu u Jesu Christu. Ek grit jelle alkien, in die naam van ons Heere Jesus Christus. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's now take a moment to greet our brothers and sisters that are sitting around us in the name of our Lord. Let us stand for the entry of the Bible. We start off by singing a hymn of praise, Jubilate Everybody. Jubilate everybody, serve the Lord in all your ways and come before His presence daily. Enter now His courts with praise. For the Lord our God is gracious and His mercy everlasting. Jubilate, jubilate, jubilate. Last one. Our call to worship this morning is adapted from Psalm 103. My inmost being, praise the holy name of God. The Lord who forgives all sins and heals our diseases. The Lord who redeems our lives from the pit and crowns us with love and compassion. The Lord who satisfies our desires with good things, who works for righteousness and justice for the oppressed. We come to praise. Praise the Lord who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. We are here to encounter our holy God today. The Lord who forgives and heals, redeems and loves, and shows compassion. We are here to share with God what's going on in our insides in our thoughts, in our minds, in our hearts. So let's approach God in humility as we come to seek Him, come to search for Him, and come to find a connection with Him. Let's have a moment 
of silent and individual prayer. Lord God, our Saviour, Redeemer and King, you are the one we trust and depend upon. You are the powerful and almighty, the one who speaks and storms and winds, fires and hail listen to you. You are the provider who ensures we have exactly just enough of what we need for every single day. You are the peacemaker, guide, caregiver and friend who's close, who cares, who listens, who helps, day after day and night after night. Lord, we come to thank you for all that you do for us, those things we see and acknowledge, and especially those things we don't see and acknowledge. We come to thank you for who you are to us, our rock, our light, our safe house. We worship and adore you, God above all gods, King above all kings. As we ponder and think of all the magnificent ways and means you look out for us and care for us and show up for us, we know that we don't always appreciate it. We know that we don't always thank you. We know that often we are so overwhelmed by the bad and the sad and the horribleness in life that we can't see past it. And we also know, Lord, that often our actions, our attitudes, our words and our thoughts does not reflect your presence. Lord, we come to you this morning with our faults, our temptations, our sin. You know where our facial expressions, our body language, our attitudes, our words cause hurt, cause division, cause damage. Sometimes without us even knowing or realizing. God, you know where our pride, our greed, our ego, our selfishness is front and center in our lives instead of your will. God, you know those moments we, we want everything our way and we make no room for others. We complain about everything without counting our blessings. Holy Spirit, as we come to repent, as we come to seek forgiveness and pardon, move within us showing us where and how we went off course this past week. Reveal to us those moments we've sinned without knowing. Hear our silent and individual prayers of confession. Jesus, you've searched our hearts. You know what's going on inside of us. You've heard our confessions. If it's acceptable in your holy sight, forgive us, pardon us, cleanse us, restore us. Thank you that we can stand upon the promises of your word that says when we truly repent, you forgive. You take away the sins and transgressions and remove it far away from us, never to think of it again. Thank you for your goodness to us. God, you know what's going on in our lives. You know our pain, our circumstances, our problems. You know how to communicate with us and you know how to come and meet us. So as we come together here today, connect with us. Move within us, around us, among us. Move in this space and place so that we may know your presence and feel your closeness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let us all take a moment to put on the fans. Let us stand for the hymn 
dear Lord and Father of mankind. Our lectionary reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 29 to 39. And Selani will be reading that for us today. Good morning. We read from Mark, chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, 
let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Tzalani. This morning, our lectionary reading once again comes from the Gospel of Mark. We continue our journey with Jesus at the start of his ministry. But we're only still in chapter 1. So what has happened in chapter 1 up to this point? Four weeks ago, we looked at Mark 1 verse 1 to 11. And we saw how Mark told us about the prophets in the Old Testament. It told us about the one that's going to come. We then read about John the Baptist, who also came to tell us about the one who was going to come. And then we met the one who came, Jesus of Nazareth. We read how Jesus was baptized, how he heard the voice of God, and how he went into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And when he came out of the wilderness, he immediately called Simon and his brother Andrew, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John, to be his disciples. And last week, we heard how Jesus began his public ministry in the synagogue, synagogue where he taught and preached with authority and then drove out an evil spirit. And all of this leads us to our reading this morning. The next little section in chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. Can you believe we are still in chapter 1, five weeks later? Now these verses that we read together this morning packs quite a punch and it's filled with lots and lots of important information. Information about different places and spaces. Places and spaces where Jesus wandered and walked, where he moved and ministered, where he tracked and taught, where he strolled and served, where he hiked and healed and where he paced and preached. So let's discover these spaces and places together. Our reading last week ended where Jesus was in the synagogue. The synagogue, as we know, is a place of prayer, of teaching, of worship, of community gathering. In other words, it's a public space. A public space specifically for men. And our reading this morning begins by telling us that Jesus, James and John went into the home of Simon and Andrew. A home in turn is a private place. A place of resting, reclining, eating, an intimate space for family and friends. It's a place where the women were important. Also immediately, we are told in verse 30 that Simon's mother-in-law is in bed with a fever. Now this tells us three things. Firstly, it tells us that we don't know her name. She's just referred to as Simon's mother-in-law which suggests to us that she's just an ordinary woman. Secondly, we are told she's in bed. Now this is very, very important. In the first century, one's role in one's community and one's family was vital. Every single man, woman, child and even animal had an important role to play. Each member of the family, each member of society needed to contribute to the household, whether that meant bringing money or doing tasks for the survival of the household. And if in some way or form your ability was altered to do that, you could be cast out. Think, for example, of the lepers. They were cast out because they couldn't contribute to the family system because they couldn't come into contact with anybody. Being sick 
bore a very heavy social cost. Simon's mother-in-law, lying in bed, tells us that she was unable to fulfill her role. Her illness cut her off from what she was able to do, from her identity, from her sense of belonging. Her illness caused that she was no longer able to do what Jesus or what God called her to do. Speak to anybody who's had a horrible illness that's turned their lives upside down. When do they begin to feel normal again? As soon as they are able to start doing the things they did before they got sick. There is joy in simply being able to do the ordinary life. Now let's just park that thought there for a moment. The third thing that this verse tells us is that Simon's mother-in-law had a fever. Remember this is a world without antibiotics. And so the seriousness of a fever should not be underestimated. We don't know the intensity of this fever. We don't know the duration of this fever. We don't know the course of this fever. All we know is that a valued family member is unable to get up and fulfill her tasks. This fever can be fatal. Now with all this in the back of our minds, we move back to the space and place between public and private. Jesus enters a private space. He takes her by the hand and he helps her up. Very simple, very direct, a very far cry from what we see on the TV when there's healing services. Jesus quietly, privately and simply takes her by the hand and helps her up. When we look at the Greek, the Greek word used here is a lot more profound. Our translations read that she was lifted up or helped up, but the Greek said that she was raised up. Jesus raised Simon's mother-in-law up. The same word that was used when Jesus was raised up from the dead. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, wherever there is a healing story, Mark uses this word to show that Jesus has power. Power to raise up. It's already giving us some view as to what we can expect at the end of this Gospel. So the fever leaves her and immediately she begins to serve her guests. Now in our world today, this leaves us with a little bit of a bitter taste, doesn't it? She was just in bed for who knows how long and immediately she needs to get up and serve the men. It sounds unkind, but we need to understand that Mark tells us this because it shows us complete healing. She didn't need time to recuperate or rest or regain her strength because Jesus restored her fully. Remember we spoke about how illnesses caused people to be unable to fulfill their calling? How illnesses took away their role, their dignity, their position in society? The fact that Simon's mother-in-law gets up and lives her life the way she was before she got ill shows us how complete her healing is. Not only that, it's very important that the word serve is there. We remember Jesus also came to serve. To serve God and to serve us. Jesus is the servant king. And the fact that Simon's mother-in-law serves shows us her respect and gratitude towards Jesus and it also shows her faithful response to what Jesus has done for her. She set free, free to serve. Now we move into our next space and place. Jesus is in this private home a place where he could rest. 
And then he hears something at the door and they open the door and suddenly there's a whole lot of people that brought all the sick, all those with diseases, all those possessed. And suddenly Jesus needs to take action. He had a moment to rest, but now he has to act. The fact that they come at sunset is important because it shows us that the Sabbath is now over. On the Sabbath, one is not allowed to work. But now that the sun set, the, the Sabbath is over, so now they can come to Jesus because now he's got to work. He's got to heal them. They open the back door and they find all these folk, Jewish folk, that heard of what Jesus had done that morning in the synagogue. They come in their numbers filled with faith and trust that Jesus is going to be able to help them and to restore them back into society. Healing in the biblical times is always about restoring someone back. Now very interesting, in verse 34 we read that Jesus healed many. Not all, like Matthew and Luke often state. Mark gives us a more realistic picture here. And it's a picture that we can relate to. Because how often do we pray for healing? And it doesn't happen the way we want. And it isn't always because we don't have enough faith or that we're just doomed to suffering. God is a God of love. He is a God who wants to restore us. But sometimes we are not healed in this life in the way we want. But we believe that we are completely healed when we enter God's nearer presence. Another important detail in this reading is that Jesus does not allow the demons to speak. Why not? Because he doesn't want them to have power. If they can't say his name, they don't have power. But also, in the Gospel of Mark, this idea that Jesus is the Messiah, this fact, is kept close to Jesus' chest until the right time becomes imminent for him to pronounce it. Because Jesus knew that if everybody knew he was the Messiah, he would get sidetracked by what the people expected from him instead of doing what God expected from him. We move into our next space and place. After a long Sabbath, after healing many and touching many and speaking to many, probably tired and exhausted and overwhelmed and a little bit stressed out, where does Jesus go? He goes to a solitary place, a silent retreat, a space of prayer. In verse 35, we read that Jesus goes to refill his cup to ensure that his will and God's will is still aligned, to listen to God's voice. What does God want him to do next? Jesus goes to God to be comforted and consoled, inspired, but also rejuvenated, re-energized, and to regain his strength for the ministry ahead. Which brings us to our last space and place. The people started looking for him. The Greek actually tells us they hunted him down. They probably thought he ran away after he opened the back door and there were crowds of people. But then Jesus comes out and immediately informs them, it's time to move on. They can't stay here any longer. Others also need to hear the good news and see Jesus' power. What does all these spaces and places tell us? What does it tell us about Jesus and what does it suggest for our own calling? God is calling you. Every single one of us has a calling. 
What is your calling? It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what gender you are. Every single one of us is called by Jesus to follow him and to serve him and one another. Sometimes in life, we get distracted from our calling. Things make us forget our calling. We are overwhelmed, we are stressed out, we get fevers. But Jesus comes to restore us. Jesus comes to heal us. Jesus comes to die on the cross. We can also move into spaces and places where we can spend time with God, where we can sit silently with God, where we can talk to God, where we can hear God's voice and feel God's presence because Jesus did this for us. When was the last time we chatted to God about our calling? When was the last time we sincerely asked God to use us as his vessel, to help us to not only serve him, but to serve one another? Just like Jesus in this reading moves through different spaces and places, public spaces, private spaces, times of rest, times of action, moments of busyness, feeling overwhelmed and being stressed and finding peace with God. So we move in different spaces and places all the time. But in those spaces and places where we move, what do we do? Wherever Jesus was, he was him. He listened, he healed, he saw, he touched, he cared, he helped. But he also practiced self-care by going to Lord, the Lord when he needed to, by going to God. And so we need to do the same. All the different spaces and places where we move, we need to serve in those spaces and places. In order for us to serve, we need to be humble. In order for us to serve, we need to be open to the movement of the Spirit. In order for us to serve, we need to make sure that our will and God's will aligns. In order for us to serve, we have to take those moments to sit at God's feet. And so we ask the question again. What is your calling? How are you called to serve the Lord in your life, in this congregation, in the places and the spaces you move? This year that lies ahead, our congregation is going to need you. We are going to need you to be willing to serve, to serve alongside us, to serve Lord, the Lord and also to serve one another. Whether that is taking up a duty on a Sunday, whether that is being able to help with the pancakes or the clothing, or whether that is making yourself available for the leadership of this church. Let us all go to God. Let us seek God's will. Let us ask Him where He wants to use us irrespective of our age, irrespective of our gender. Because wherever God sends you, you are not alone. He goes out ahead of you and he equips you. He gives you wisdom. He gives you strength. He gives you the right words at the right time. And he gives you the love to love those around you. We are now going to stand and then we're going to sing the last hymn, which is maybe be a shining light. After that, we're going to remain standing for the benediction. And then we're going to sing a benediction over one another. So it's your choice whether you want to hold hands or stand in the corner being grumbles. Whatever you want to do, you do that. All right? And then we're going to remain standing for the exit of the Bible followed by the elements. So let us stand and sing together. May we be a shine.
Ubabalo le nkosi yetu u Yezu Kristu. Utando luka tiko. Ubutlelwana lo moya u yinkwele. Malube nani nonke. Ena umaki genade van Christus. Die liefde van God en die gemeenskap van die heilige gees sal met elkeen van julle wees en bly. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen.